Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay this Moore. This is Greg Proof. This is Jordan Harbinger. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan this is East. Sebastian Younger. This is Rick Morata. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. Hey, this is Scott Baxter. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hi, it's Elliot Randall, and you're watching The Breakdown Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Yes, you are. Elliot Randall's an American session guitarist now working in London. He's played Correct. on a jillion records. That's jillion with a J. Probably most notably that rip frest of a solo that starts and then bisects reeling in the years. Uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit and about that composition and the solo that provided the defining melody in the theme song from Fame by Irene Cara. And I picked that out for a specific reason. But he's played with the Doobies and Steely Dan with his childhood friend Skunk Baxter. Also played with the likes of Carly Simon and Peter Frampton. But along with his amazing work as a guitarist, he's been a musical consultant for Saturday Night Live for a variety of companies. He's written jingles with electronic music companies, leaders like Korg, Akai, Roland, Yamaha. And he's managed somehow to remain an independent force throughout his career. He's joining us today from London, where he frequently works with uh, with the Wesonator, my co-host. And gents, <laughs> thank you both for joining us. Elliot, thank you for playing Pleasure. tunes that uh, entertain us and challenge us and, uh, and have been enhanced our minds and our ear holes. Well, thank you very much. And long may it continue. Terrific, terrific. Yeah. I brought up fame because I find it interesting that you played on that song and that you also went to the uh, New York High School for the Arts. High School of uh, Music and Art, yeah. Uh, high, school, high School of Music and Art. Back in my day, <clears throat> there were two big music schools, the High School of Music and Art and the High School of Performing Arts. I see. And not long after I left, uh, they became – one and it became the the LaGuardia High School for the Performing Arts or something for that effect. Okay, so but actually, Fame was the high, high school of Performing Arts on West Forty Six Forty Yeah Forty Six Street. Ah, uh, so not the same school. Yeah, related, related. Pretty just, much, yeah, yeah. I thought that was a full circle moment that you that you got to play on that song. Did the gravity of that? Um, Way on you at all? Did 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 that uh, did that hit you at the time? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. In fact, funny enough, were I to choose again in hindsight, it would have been the high school of performing arts that I attended, rather <laughs> oh. than music art, because it was it was more focused on career oriented musicians and artists and and dancers and singers of all ilks, whereas music and art was very classical. I see. I see. Uh, I have a question for Wes, because we have talked about your solo and reeling in the years. Okay. So, Wes, can you just describe for our listeners what the gear that was used on that solo? Because it sounds so different than, you know, so much else that was on the radio at the time. Well, I hope I get this right. <laughs> okay. On the spot. On the spot. I think it was that Village Recorder. Is that right, Elliot? At Village, that's correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and. For, for some reason, there were no amps <laughs> available uh, at the time. The story, right? Yep. And okay. the only amp they could find was an Ampeg SVT bass rig. Right. With the I, big, I've always hated. With the big, uh, with the big you know, 8x10 cab. Uh, right. and as I know it, it, they just turned everything up to 11, put an AKG 414 in front of it, and yep. uh, he let rip. <laughs> exactly exactly no pedals no nothing guitar wow. cable, amplifier and it was this, i read somewhere that it was a strat you played oh yes yes yeah which blew my mind because it sounded like a les paul to me well uh, um a couple of, yeah a couple of years before i had installed a um Richard humbucker okay into the, into the neck position Right, which is the warmest of the positions, and that could very well be why a lot of people think it's, it, it could have been a Les Paul. Don't you have Gibson big frets on your neck as well? Yes, Gibson bass fret, but I don't think you can hear them that well. <laughs> All right. So one of the things that I really liked about Reeling in the Years was it, it opened with the solo, and mm -hmm. 
the the opening solo is is different from the the solo in the solo break and i you know definitely worth talking about both of them but how come songs don't open with guitar solos anymore <laughs> are there songs anymore wow, okay. <laughs> I, don't, I don't mean that disrespectfully i really don't because there's a lot of great stuff it just doesn't tend to hit the airwaves as it were you know yeah. uh, um, yeah, there's tons of great stuff that gets overlooked. Um, and record companies, if you will, they still exist and they still pretty much control what gets out to the public. They have formulas. You know, I have friends in Nashville who are complaining to me, I can't believe it, the record companies don't want to use such and such instrument in this year. You know, and it doesn't really make that much sense to me, but it's the way it goes, you know. Yeah. You've been bucking formulas your whole career, though. Hell yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> Would you say that? That's a calculated move, right? Well, I've always thought that if I'm going to play music, I should play what I want. All right. And then, barring 20-some-odd years in the New York studios doing the jingle business, which wasn't always what I wanted to do, it helped pay for my artistic pursuits. Okay. 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 Fair enough. I think, uh, you know, most of us pay for our artistic pursuits one way or another. And if you can pay for them by actually playing, that's the best way. Yeah. yeah. So, Wes, how is it working with Elliot? Because he's, he's uh, you know, a groundbreaker and a free thinker. What, what's it like having to twist knobs for him? Oh, it's always fun. You know, yeah. I'm, uh, I, just, I just remember that I think the first, first record we worked on together was, was at Rack. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, it was, just, it was just just nice because Elliot would be sat on the couch behind me, and I would just be doing doing my thing. And occasionally he'd sort of tap on the shoulder and go, "Hey, can you make that sound more like that? That more like that?" And you know, it's the way I love working is it's you know this this dual interaction. So yeah, I think we, we both have very similar. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Uh, yeah, okay. Very similar audio sensibilities. Oh, that's good. And, and we have that yeah. little, we call it the Bluetooth break. Bluetooth. You know? that's right. That's right. Uh-huh. Uh, I mean, we'll often, you know, go for the same thing, you know, whichever one of us is sitting at the desk or is thinking about an idea. Yeah, I mean, it's nice to have a shorthand with somebody, but it's even better when you have Bluetooth brain because it's, <laughs> it's like, well, that's what I was going to say. I hadn't figured out how to say it, and you're already headed that direction. So yeah. that's one of the things we like about West uh, anyway, is he's kind of got an ESP about him, and he wears great hats. <laughs> so that, oh, yeah. that helps. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, Elliot, when you uh, decided to – Stick around London, play around London. What what made that what made that decision? Well, this was about 1990, mm-hmm. um, and all the studios in America were going down the toilet. Wow, you know, between MIDI and uh, so many people putting together little home studios that, and, and agencies putting together home studios as well. Uh, well, home studio, business studios, but it. it what was once a real vehicle for artistic expression kind of started to dis- disappear. Luckily, my wife is English, and I was able to come over here and do work and do whatever I wanted to. Yeah, you get um, to stick around. Yeah, so I, I started you know, pursuing, at first, some studio work here in London. And uh, it was nice because... Even being an older guy, you know, I was um, I was the new kid on the block, so to speak. <laughs> okay. So all sorts of really nice offers. Yeah, that's but cool. at that time, you know, I mean, the same fate was befalling British studios. And a lot of the records that I was asked to make as a player didn't really kill me. They didn't, you know, they, they didn't get the spark going. And I don't say this to be offensive to any of the, the folks that I worked for, but digital was also in at that point, right? So mm-hmm. people were getting used to their Pro Tools rigs and, you know, I'd play the first eight bars or something and the producer would turn to me and say, great, that's it. That's all we need. We'll just copy and paste what you did into the rest of the song. And it would uh, drop me up the wall. 
Because yeah. part of what makes a song or a recording, or a song or a recording, special is that it grows. Right. And yeah. okay, maybe some producers see a way of making it grow their own way, but it That's wasn't involving true. me. It wasn't asking for my creativity. Well, and as a performer, as a guitar player who grew up in a generation where performance meant something, Mm-hmm. you had a sensibility that said, here's what I'm going to do in the first phrase, and I'm holding something back mm-hmm. so that when I get to the second, I have something to build on, and then and then I can really start ripping. And when you get told in the middle of your holding back phrase, oh, that's enough, we're going to copy and paste that. Like, I didn't even really give you the goods. Exactly. I see you're a musician. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but... You did. You didn't shy away from the electronic revolution, though. You stayed current with it. It seems. Um, I've always loved electronics. Um, okay. Back since, well, in the '60s, you know, when when people were using wah wah pedals and fuzz tones and stuff, I got right into it straight away. It's like, oh, it's an interesting extension. You know, any effect if used properly and in the right context can be great. It can also be oh, terrible, but, you know, it, it, it depends <laughs> on, on, on the person, on the player. So there's a whole set of sensibilities around that. Um, in 1971, I was playing in the pit of the original Broadway production of Jesus Christ Superstar. Uh-huh. And a friend of mine introduced me to a guy called Mike Matthews. Okay. Mike Matthews, it turns out, is the president of Electroharmonics Corporation. Uh-huh. And they make more effects than you can shake a stick at for the rest of your life. I mean, they're coming up with new ones every month. And Mike and I became friends. Good he, guy to know. He asked me to, you know, if I'd be interested in trying his stuff out. I said, yeah, of course, you know. And the original thing that he had was this little box called LPV1 Power Booster. LPV stands for Linear Power Booster. Yeah. And what it did was it added amplitude to the signal going into the amp. So you got a lot louder, and of course, the louder it got, the more distorted it got. So it wasn't quite a fuzz tone, but it it wasn't what you call an overdrive pedal either. This yeah. had to switch on off and, and, and a little volume knobby. The same year, I became friendly with the folks from Musitronics, who had the the Mutron Three, which is that wonderful that wah wah e kind of thing that Stevie Wonder uses on his clavinet. Uh huh. And uh, some other really nice devices. And I wound up my first couple of years at NAM. I want to just tell I, our listeners: listen to Higher Ground, and you'll hear that the, 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 in the opening right. of Higher Ground. That's where you hear that. Right. Yep. Uh, back to NAM. Yeah. So NAM, the National Association for Music Merchants or Merchandisers, however you want to call it, yeah. um, put on these humongous shows every January, January. Uh-huh. Yep, in in uh, Orange County. Yep. And um, I started. The last humongous one in, in July in Nashville. That's Nashville. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And who knows where it's all going to go at this point? Right. Yeah. Um, so, my first two, the first year I, I demoed, I was a demo player for Musitronics. And the second year I was a demo player for Electroharmonics. Ah. And as, as things happen at NAM, you wind up meeting loads and loads of people making great. Yeah. Friends. And um, I know a couple of people I've met at NAM, <laughs> uh, present company included. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Wes and I met at NAM. Hey, uh, I'm going to take a pause for a second because I want to go back to that. But what years are you talking about there where, where you were a, a, a player at, that uh, was on the floor? 72, 73. Oh, boy. Uh huh. Possibly 71, 72. I'm not sure. Okay. No, 72, 73. So really, it had just started in L.A. because they used to hold that show in Chicago. That's right. And then they moved it to L.A. right around then. Yep. So uh, that was really when, I mean, the music business, a lot, you know, some of our younger listeners are are less aware that the music business didn't really, wasn't as based in L.A. as it is now, just as recently as the early 70s. I mean, it started to migrate out that way, but... There were a lot of uh, studio musicians in New York who were making their living with a tie and a sports coat on. And uh, it, it wasn't <laughs> until the late 60s and early 70s when the scene started to come to Los Angeles. That's correct. 
So when you're working with Elliot and he's reaching for a sound, you know, he says that you have um, that you have Bluetooth brain. You, you always kind of know what he's thinking and you can stay a step ahead of him. But what are you doing intuitively to, um, to stay ahead of him? Because I know that that's as much a conscious effort as an unconscious effort. What are you thinking while you're, you know, while you're busy, busy engineering, what's making you the best engineer? Uh, well, I, it's, it's, you know, a lot of it is gut feeling, obviously, but I think, you know, because, because of, of the musical heritage that, that, you know, where Elliot comes from yeah, hap- happens to be, you know, within my, You've played on one or two tunes that are in your wheelhouse. Exactly. So, <laughs> so you sort of immediately reach for a specific sound, you know, whether it's on his guitar or on on the drums or the bass that we're working on. You know, okay. it's sort of, you know, you start thinking doobies, eagles, you know, that that kind of vibe, and, and you you kind of veer towards that land as a jumping off point. Look at the size of them cans. Good gracious! <laughs> Look at them. We left off at you being a uh, a player endorser on the floor at NAM in the early seventies, and then I just you know for our listeners now and in the future because we don't know the future of the NAM show right now uh, because of all of this madness we're going through. Mm-hmm. It has always been an enormous thing where we all got together and we all saw some of our favorite players, and as we wandered around from you know uh, manufacturers booth to booth, we would see players who played great stuff and get to meet them and see the gear that they were playing on and see the gear that they were launching in the coming year. And to have walked through the NAM show and seen you on the floor, um, that had to be a treat for somebody in 71, 72. You were just starting to say that you met a lot of people there at NAM. Talk about that. And one other thing, last year at NAM, we met Skunk Baxter. Okay. So that was a highlight for us. Getting back to you, who were you meeting and how was that affecting what you were playing and what you were headed into? Oh, uh, gosh. Met the guys from 10CC. Oh, yeah. Kevin and Lyle. Uh-huh. I met guys like Tommy Tedesco. Yeah. Uh, Carol King. You know, the whole Wrecking Crew contingent. Too many to really re- recount. Sure. Uh, and, you know, some of them actually were less known to the public at large. Right. I mean, Chicago had an incredible array of great studio musicians. Mm. Yeah, you won't have heard their names. You might have seen them on an album cover for the most part, but they were incredible. Yeah, um, the same is true with people from. There's a whole swath of studios that goes to, throughout the southeast. Mm-hmm. You know, you got the Muscle Shoals Muscle guys, Shoals. You got, yeah, you got the Memphis guys. Mm-hmm. You yeah, got Yep, the guys from Jackson, Mississippi, Malico. Oh yeah. Right. So you know, it, it was a, it was a very fertile breeding ground. Wow, yeah, those years brought us some groundbreaking stuff, and especially since that period of time was really the uh, the peak of music that was coming away from New York. And I'm not talking about the generation of New York that was Bob Dylan. I'm talking about the generation of New York that that included all the guys who played their sessions in sport coats. So really what rock and roll did for us was it introduced us a whole generation of players who were rockers and you were among them. And so you got to hang out with them at that time. You know, I I never met Tommy Tedesco before he passed, but I've been fortunate enough to become friends with Danny, his son. And, you know, what a great legacy he left behind and what a great job capturing that legacy Danny did. And it really is a a nod to the whole generation. And, you know, I didn't see you in that picture, but I know that your contributions that um, to the generation that really pretty immediately followed them were really what we celebrate about the songs that you played on, because by then it was sort of became a little more it was a lot more mainstream for, you know, studios to hire the players that were in that were in New York and not in sport coats. And of course, in L.A. Of course. Yes. So you got to benefit from that. What other players were you listening to and looking for at NAMM? I'm curious about that. Really a vast array. Not as much guitar. Focus. OK. Billy Cobham. Uh, New Yorker, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Jeff, the Picaro brothers. Sure. Lee Sklar, you know, that, that whole, there's a whole 
group of very, very famous players, very famous now, and yeah. we're all roughly the same age. So yeah, that's, that's your generation. I mean, I, I'd lump you in with those guys. Yeah, yeah. And also, you know, in those days, record companies had rather large budgets. Right. Of course, they the could afford to, those performances. To be real about it, yeah. at the end of the day, the people who were paying for it were the artists, not the record yeah. companies. Right. The record companies were fronting the money. So if, if a record became, yeah, I mean, if a record became really big, then the record they companies recruit. would sit in spades. Yeah. Um, so we were all doing a lot of flying around. I found myself going to L.A., racking up more air moths than I knew what to do with. Wow. And, and Chicago and Florida. I did a bunch of work over Criteria. You know, it, it's just adventure upon adventure. And, and of course, being able to expand your circle of friends, comrades, you know, players. Yeah, colleagues. Hmm. The, uh, the generation of player that you came from also had a whole different form of creativity that you contributed to. But we talked for a moment about how you contributed some of that creativity to some jingles. Can you tell us some of the jingles that we might recognize that you played on? Because I, I can't pick, couldn't pick them out. A coconut smile makes you feel good. You okay. know, all the way back to those days. Uh huh. So, um, and in fact, that wonderful glug 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 sound at the end of the of the commercial is my friend Suzanne Chiani on a synthesizer on a Buchla synthesizer. Wow. She really created awesome. that sound. Um, so we were given quite a lot of latitude. And I remember once I had uh, a session work for a company called Sherman and Kahn, Stanley Kahn, who's not with us anymore. Funny guy. You know, he was the business guy as opposed to the music guy. Sherman was, was the music guy. At one point he came over and said, no, I don't like that sound. Can you remember? And he did it in a way that was not that nice. So I came back. And again, I regret some of my attitudes from the old days. I came back just as not nice. I said, wow. excuse me, I just played this on three hit records that you may or may not have heard. So I think I'm going to use this sound. Thank you very much. They said, okay. And it worked out really great. You know, whatever that was, I have no, no re recollection of what the jingle was. But it was, you know, it was nice to be able to, for the most part, the producers were just, you know, yeah, go do whatever you want. I mean, you might get handed a chord chart, and some of it might be like, wow, this is fly shit, you know? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and there were any one of a number of ways to take it. Either the arranger wanted you to play it note for note, which you learn to do as a studio musician. You have oh. to be able to read pretty well. Yeah. Um, or you take it as, okay, this is a simile of what the person wants. Right. Or you come up with a whole different approach. And any one of them could work. It just depends on what the situation is, and you're being able to read the arranger, the producer, the client. Okay, Wes. Yep. Uh, how, how, often is Elliot, um, how often does Elliot get saucy with you? <laughs> well, we get saucy with each other all the time. <laughs> Here we go. That's the right response. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you know, yeah. Uh, I, don't think, of... I don't think we've ever had a bad word, though. Not a single mean, mean word in all the time that we've known no. each other. No, 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 no. It goes no. back quite a ways now. Yeah. Well, we're always, always winding each other up and cracking jokes. Hmm. Well, that's good. <laughs> that's good. Because saucy doesn't have to be malicious. No. Right. And, sure. when it, and when you can get saucy without being malicious is, uh, is a great recipe for, you know, for terrific tunes. Well, and uh, malicious, malicious is counterproductive in a creative environment. Yeah. Oh, sure. God, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and we, Wes and I have had our share of questionable clients. <laughs> challenging opportunities. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and at the end of the day, I mean, one has to realize the vibe always goes on to the recording. Yeah. If it's a great vibe, it's on the recording. If it's not such a great vibe, it's on the recording. It's too. on the recording, yeah. The tape does not lie. If that's anybody right. if anybody remembers the simile of tape. Yeah, um, that's right. It's funny because some of my production idols uh -huh. really understood that. And it it became who? we uh, name names on this show. Who are you talking hey, about? Uh, sure. Um Joel Dorn. Okay. Joel Dorn produced 
Roberta Flack's big hits, Killing Me Softly, and mm. a couple other biggies. He produced less, like 11 Russ on Roland Kirk albums. He started out as a DJ in Philadelphia. Okay. He was an absolute genius at vibe. Right? Awesome. He, was, he was literally tone deaf, and he was also literally completely deaf in one ear. I remember there'd be times they'd come over and start yelling, hey, that hurt, and he'd go, other ear, other ear. <laughs> yeah, this side. Yeah. That's but, great. But, you know, it's no different than uh, than a carpenter showing up with a toolbox that makes everybody go, look at that bunch of junk. What's he bringing that stuff on the job site for? And then he builds a cabinet better than you do because he's been working with those tools and he understands the outcome better than somebody else does. That's right. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's it, funny you should mention that because I, I, I it, just as an aside with that mm-hmm. you know, a whole big bunch, box of junk. Uh, in New York, I used to ca- walk around with an electric on one shoulder, an acoustic on the other shoulder, and a bag of electronics that would weigh me down. And I'd take the subway because it was quicker than a, a cab usually. Built up my strength that way. And when I got to L.A., I, saw, I lived in L.A. twice. The second time, 82 and 83. Good time to live in L.A.? It was. It was indeed. But by that time, it had migrated from a guitar and a guitar and a bag to half a dozen road cases full of guitars and amps and this and that and the other. Yeah. And even though I did, I played the game. I used to think to myself, this is so stupid. You know, you, you want my Strat to sound like a telly? You want my Gibson to sound like a... I could do that. You know, I mean, that's, that's why you have a little graphic equalizer. You know, if you want a telly, you just whack down all the lows, tweak up all the highs, bang, there you go. Yeah. Um, so it there was there was a lot of sort of extraneous showmanship going on. But it's part of the game. So if that's oh. what if that's what the clients want to see and that's what they're paying you your money your money for, you do it. Yeah. Speaking of extraneous showmanship, what's that thing around your neck, Wes? What that? <laughs> like I'm just yeah. That's I'm just my, giving you a hard time. My social distancing thing. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Now you are the masked man. We had uh, Rick Murata has been on the show a couple of times. Oh, and, uh, and, and I, I love Rick so much, man. I Me love too. that guy. Me too. He's a beautiful player as well. He's yeah. from being an ace guy. Uh, yes. Player. Both of those things. Yeah. Beautiful player, ace guy. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and also member of your musical generation. I'm sure you guys have crossed paths on a recording once or twice. We made a lot of records together. Yeah. Yeah. He mentioned, and that brings us up because, you know, the, the subject of bringing in somebody like you or like Rick is really to the purpose of bringing in a player is to allow that player be, to be the interpreter. And if you're going to, you know, lean in on somebody and go, hey, man, I wrote the part, play the part that I wrote, you know, there's certainly a place for that. But, you know, what Rick said on the show was, well, why'd you hire me? You can get somebody cheaper than me to play this bullshit. He stole my line. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Okay. I mean, the, the feeling is true. It's like, well, you know, anybody can play. Anybody who reads can play this. Yeah. So, but, you know, it is, at the end of the day, aside from being a place to express your artistic bananasness, it's also, it's, you're also doing it for the money. Okay. And um, if that's what somebody wants, that's what they get. You know? That's right. Everybody's got to well, make a living and everybody's got a customer, right, Wes? And they're, and they're paying to put your name on the record. Yeah. Well, there, that, there is that. Yep. That too. Yep. And, you know, that doesn't, that's not for nothing. Because sometimes oh. you get the right attention when somebody says, oh, look at this. You know, I, yesterday... Just saw a post from a friend of mine, uh, Mike Carpenter. I'd just like to shout out my friends on this on this show. <laughs> Mike Carpenter, hey, Mike. <laughs> a great producer and uh, and keyboard player, and he was highlighting a recording that he had done. It was a remix of a, a J Lo song that he did, and he brought up a name that I hadn't heard in thirty years. A guy named Mano Hayes. And I saw that name and I thought, man, I grew up in Vallejo, California. And while I was growing up, Mano Hayes was playing in churches and that boy was bad. And then I didn't know whatever happened to him. 
So I was just relieved to know that he was still playing and still making records and he's out there somewhere. So wherever you are out there, Mano, keep doing it. I hope you're doing great. Elliot, if you have record budget now and you want to sort of divide up that money knowing that you have modern technology, you got Wes uh, behind the board, what do you think are important factors of music that you've made throughout the years that are getting left behind now where you would put that budget? Hey, this is P.A. Turner from Lions Rock Productions. We create podcasts around here. And if you, your brand, or your company want to figure out how to do a podcast, just talk to me. I'll give you the advice on the right gear, the best plan, and show you how to take a podcast that makes sense for you, that's sustainable, that's scalable, and fun. Hit me up at Pete at BreakItDownShow.com. Let me help. I want to hear about it. What do you think are important factors of music that you've made throughout the years that are getting left behind now where you would put that budget? Oh, good question. Really good question. It has to do with being able to, for me, I like spontaneous combustion. Uh, I, like, I like putting however many players are going to make a rhythm section, really cook, all in the same room, all at the same time. Yeah. We're all going to, overdub, we're all going to play together. Yes. If you need for an overdub later, okay, we'll deal with it. But let's get the cooking going now. Yeah. yeah. The bass player might be, you know, Playing do 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 ba do 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 ba do do, and the drummer says, "Hey man, why don't you take out the second one?" So it goes do do ba do do, and all of a sudden it's magic. If the yeah. bass player is by himself sitting in his own home studio, who's going to tell him? Who's going to give him advice? Yeah, you playing know? exactly what's written. Yeah, and I found that you know working even with today's media, you know, you want to do a Zoom chat or a Skype chat or whatever, it's not the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, the client can say, oh, maybe you could do such and such. But, man, you want to be in the same room together. Yeah. I know even now, if I have to record remotely, it's always really important for me to have Wes in the room with me. Because, you know, there's somebody I can look in his eyes and he's either saying, oh, that sucked. Or, oh, I like it. You know, you get, you get, you get instant yeah. feedback. Right. And that warmth that goes on, Again, it goes on to the recording. Yes, it oh. does. It makes its way there. Yeah. So everybody being in the same room, you're not only giving each other feedback, but there's also that silent feedback of, you know, I played that thing. And, and we pick it up subliminally as well. So we're not just consciously looking for feedback and hearing, hey, take out that second part. But sometimes you just try something because there's a guy there. And that becomes the reason to surround yourself with that bunch of guys. Who do you have that kind of chemistry with? What what players are you, you know, what players do you have the most fun with? Okay, so if I had to put together a band right now, uh -huh. the very first thought... Hang on, give me a notepad. Okay, this comes <laughs> to mind, would be Steve Gadd and Tony Levin. Okay, come, you're just making this easy. But we all grew up together. So <laughs> it's like, you know, our musical sensibilities, while they, our interests have certainly drifted into different areas other yeah. than when we were just playing together, there's just a familiarity. You know that if you're going to take a breath, that person's going to breathe with you. Yeah. In New York, we also, there's a drummer called Alan Schwartzberg. Uh, you may Alan or may not know his name. He's been um, on a million, Google him. He's been on a million hit records. Okay. Uh, but he chose the life of living in the studio rather than, you know, being out there on the road with lots of different performers. So, terrific. but he's somebody that, you know, it's like, I know that not only will the humor be there, but the sensibilities, the time, uh, Paul Schaefer, used, we had a band with what we used to call ourselves the cats, uh -huh. right? And it was Alan Schwartzberg, Paul Schaefer, uh, Will Lee, yeah. John Trope, and myself. Fuck. It was, it was nice. a great band. It was a really, really good band. And it was another one of those combos where, we could all read each other's minds before we even, you know, hit the downbeat. We knew where we were going. I or just, I, need to, I need to say these words on the show. We had Elliot Randall on the show and he said the words, I was in a band in New York with Paul Schaefer called the cats. <laughs> I don't think cooler words have ever been spoken on 750 episodes of this show. Oh, I love it. I love it. <laughs> you know, you know, what, the reason I mentioned that, actually, I was going to get to the, to the I was going to praise Schwartzberg and say that um, 
Schaefer, who we used to call Schaefer Rachi, as you can uh, imagine. Schaefer Rachi. Yeah. Um, he came up with this thing once, and Ali, he made the click disappear. Yeah. And it was all about, you know, understanding your environment. And literally, you know, if, you're, if your time is good, you make the click disappear. Make the click disappear. Yeah. Now, some different, so different drummers will put the, will feel the, the beat slightly different. Uh-huh. A little ahead, a little behind. You know, Roger Hawkins was on the, the behind side. Yeah. Purdy kind of. Purdy, yeah. A little bit on the front side. And being able to play with these people in their groove. Uh-huh. It's just so beautiful. It's, it's yeah. Like- oh, man. This is the coolest thing ever. Hey, I am, you know, I'm a, a bit of a music historian, of course, because I love hearing all these names. And I am not familiar with Alan Schwartzberg. So thank you for hipping me to him. I've got to go look up Alan Schwartzberg now and see what he's doing. Oh, good. good. Yeah, that's, that's great. So if you're putting this band together and your recording process is to all be in the same room and you're all yeah. going to start cooking, you're going to be, you're making musical gumbo. Uh, what's next in the process? Who, you know, who do you look to for, I'm not even going to say that. What's next in the process? Here's everybody. We're cooking. Let's go. Wes is putting it on tape. Well, if I'm the producer, then it's one thing. If I'm just wearing the musician hat, it's another. So oh, great. if I'm the producer, I have to then determine, you know, is this, going to make me happy 20 years from now when I listen to it. Ooh. That's a, that's a real tall order. Because yeah. you're, making, you're making a painting. You're, you're doing a sonic painting. Mm-hmm. And you really have to make judgment calls. I mean, now, of course, we have the technology where if you want to erase that little piece of music, there you can do that and add something else to it. But ultimately, you don't want to have to repair. You want to be able to go, yeah, this is what it was meant to be. Okay. All right. I guess what you can read into that is I'm, I'm sort of a spontaneous kind of guy. Yeah. Uh, so I like to be surprised. I like to be delighted. The only solo that I ever play almost identically is Real in the Years. And the reason I do that is because if people are coming to see me play live, then yeah. they're going to want to hear that. They know and, it. Yeah. They want yeah. to feel it. They want and, to feel it the same way. Yeah. And so to deviate from that is really just me having a wank. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I'll say as a listener, I, you know, if I'm buying that ticket and I see you're on the bill, I do want to hear that. And I, I hate to be that guy, but it's true that I, I want to feel that. And then, and then I want you to expand it a little so you can have the way. I did that at the very end at the last solo. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now um, when you did that solo in the, on the record though, is that you on the harmonies too? No, the part that goes that, 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 that that's actually Denny Diaz. Oh, okay. That's a written part. I see. Okay. With a few altercations with the the quintuplets. But other than that, it's written. Now, my thing was to just come in and feel it. Uh You know, um, they played the tune down once. I said, great, can I see a lyric sheet? Because to me, it's it's, if I'm playing to a song that has lyrics, then I want to be able to be an extension or at least be supportive Mm. of what what the writer is trying to say. Yeah, enhance the message, enhance the vibe. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so now, there's a lot of great lessons here, man. Let's keep oh, going. Good. Yeah. Yeah, this so awesome. so they played it and said, "Right, let's okay, let's let's do it, you know." But do it to them actually only meant run it down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I played it all Why? because they brought you in to be the expert and they were giving you the space to do that. Yeah, but if they hit the red button yeah. Then conceivably the solo would have even been better uh, than what you hear on the record. At least that's what some of us who were in the room think. Okay. And in fact, Gary Katz, the guy who produced it, said, I learned something very special from you that they always, always hit the red button. Hit the red button. Don't always. Tape. No, this, I mean, okay, tape. In those days it was tape. But now it's just zeros and ones. You have nothing to lose. Nothing at all. If anything, there's, there's too much. I mean, it's, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it's too much to sort through. Okay, now you mentioned, and I appreciate you dividing the tasks because you mentioned if you're the producer, here's how you feel. But I'm going to be the producer for a second, and then I'm going to give Wes a crack at it. Okay. So 
if I'm the producer and let's say I'm going to bring in an artist and that artist is uh, Lady Gaga. Okay. And she's got a lyric sheet for you and she's got a tune that's, you know, uh, let's say kind of she's got a message for the times and, you know, there's a little bit of, you know, a little solemn feel, a little, you know, but she wants to be optimistic and ultimately it's an optimistic song that's, you know, that's about a checkered past. And uh-huh. she gives you that lyric sheet. You kind of get that vibe from her. As the producer, I'm going to say, look, here's what I want, guys. I want something kind of mid-tempo, but I need, I'm giving you guys some space to express because I don't know what I want yet. I just need a mid-tempo thing and I need you to leave enough space for her to sing, you know, and, and I give you some basic chords. Where do you take it? And I'm going to ask you to lead the band. My first determination would have to be, given that it's Lady Gaga uh-huh. and that she's quite a character, where does she want to take this? What, is she trying? I heard what you said she's trying to say, but is she trying to say it in a way that stark, startling, relax you and woo you into this place? Uh-huh. Yeah. So once I had that idea. Okay. I would be able to then express that to the rhythm section. Uh-huh. Instead of me being a musical director, is what you des- describe it. And I love to take chances, and I love to do really far out things. But having said that, is it my place in this Lady Gaga track to do that, or is it best for me to hold back uh-huh. and simply be supportive along with the rest of the rhythm section? Or I could say to you, look, I have some some ideas. But why don't I just lay down the rhythm track first and then let me explore what I might do melodically on top of that. Okay. This is, ladies and gentlemen, this is why you get pros. This is where experience comes in. Wes, where do you want to take this recording? (laughs) Where do I want to take it? Uh, A great sounding room. (laughs) Yeah. I knew knew that was coming. I knew it. Okay. Because they all want to play together. And if they're playing together, the room has to, you know, the room is going to set off an energy as well. Not, ah. not just emotionally, but sonically. Uh, yeah. So obviously, you know, I'll, I can only approach this as, uh, you know, technically. So I'll have to figure out mic placement and, and, and musician placement as well. Make sure. Yeah, how do you see each other? You know, you've got to see each other. Side the vibe of each other. Everybody's got to be able to, you know have a wink or, or, you know, somebody, somebody see, Oh, oh, he's up to something. I have to anticipate what's going on. So I think that that's my job. And then the way I'd approach it is to make it, to capture it as, as clean, but also as raw as possible. Um, You know, I, there's two different levels in the room with Elliot. Yeah. I mean, do you, do you want to, you want to you know compress an eq on the way in and stuff like that i've i've always approached things of put a mic in front of it if it sounds great that's it if it doesn't quit playing around move it change the amp whatever well elliot and i have changed the players as well (laughs) Uh, there's that yeah indeed and then it's great room to Mm -hmm. just hit record and and not get out of the way way. Yeah. yeah 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 terrific Okay, Joel Dorn was a DJ. This is why I think DJs make great producers, because when you have, and you said he was deaf in one ear and tone deaf practically, but what he could hear was feel. That's right, that's right. He also had had an encyclopedic knowledge of jazz. ah. I remember one time, I was still so young, I didn't even know the name. He said, Ellie, can you give me a little bit of Freddie Green? Uh. Huh? (laughs) <laughs> yeah. It's like this. And it just sort of emulated what Freddie would have done back in a big band. So, you know, message. lessons galore. Yeah. 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 No, being a DJ, that, that's, you know, being a good DJ, an enthusiastic DJ, a, mm-hmm. a DJ who pays attention, yeah. not just to the payola stubs that they give you. There were huge influences, really, all of our growing up. In New York, we had. A couple of progressive FM radio stations. Yeah, and I, I really grew to love the DJs, and yeah. eventually got to know them and love them even more. You know, on a one-to-one basis. 
but they did it because they loved it. Back when you could have a uh, relationship with a DJ, and not necessarily with the person, but with the personality, like you could trust a DJ to break a record for you and know that it was going to be something good. Mm. Yeah, we miss those days, man. <laughs> yes. Yes, we so, do. But the reason I bring that up is because uh, of my own self-serving purpose. I was a DJ for nine years. And what happens when you're a DJ? And I wasn't a radio <clears throat> DJ, although I did have a radio show, and that's how I met Pete. Before that, I was a DJ, you know, just a live mobile DJ. And when you have the pressure on you of playing the, the, the right song, um, I know a lot of musicians think, oh, that dude's just a DJ. He's up there spinning CDs. <laughs> But what happens when you're in a room with a few hundred people and they know you have 10,000 songs, you have to play the perfect song right then. That's right. Every moment. So what that pressure does for you is it starts to give you a temperature for, sure. for certain things. And, you know, that this plays right into somebody who can, can hear, feel, and be tone deaf because – when you have that pressure, I mean, Dr. Dre, perfect example. Mm. Yeah, that was the most successful producer in, in the last 20 years. And the reason why was because he spent years and years in clubs where if he was playing the wrong song, that club might get shot up. <laughs> <laughs> pressure. Yeah. You yeah. start to understand the temperature of people and, and your sonic responsibility. So I, I, t I tip my hat to, uh, to DJ producers. Um, but, you know, it, 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 I don't mean to interrupt you. It's a no, very no. similar vibe to when you're on stage because mm -hmm. oftentimes you write your set list out. Yeah. But depending on who you are and how complex the show is with lighting, sound, all that. Yeah. I just might feel like, you know what? That tune, I'll do that later on. Yeah, Again, no, it, yeah. it's gauging the temperature of the audience. Sure. You, yeah. you know, what, what's going to make them walk away from that evening going, man, that was the best time I've had for – forever you know there's a real thing about wanting to please your audience yes do you ever have you found yourself in a position frequently where you were on stage and you knew the vibe wasn't right but whoever was at the helm di didn't pick up on the vibe being uh being wrong sure oh, yeah sure. what what do you do in that situation well there are all different variations of it yeah. uh if i'm not at the helm i will simply do my very very best to help them move the show along. If it's somebody that I actually uh, feel comfortable enough with, yeah. I might even suggest, with, you know, whisper in their ear or something, why don't you try such and such a tune next? You yeah. know, yeah. just coming from, you know, my experience as, as a, a player on stage all my life. The thing is to always be as professional as you can. It's uh -huh. always to be as giving to the audience. You know, when I used to play with the Doobie Brothers, the thing that made them most remarkable, and we're talking about from maybe 1975 through 81, basically the Michael McDonald years. Oh. Um, this band used to play, we used to give 150%, whatever the show was. Not 100%, not 125, 100. We would just do everything we could to make that audience love it. And you know, when you do that, the audience gives it back to you double right. Yeah. So you're getting 300% back. And they then give you, you're giving 600. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's just an amazing feeling. Words sort of can't describe, you know, the, the thrill that you get. Because it's a combination of intimacy and excitement and, you know, gargantuan crowds. Or, or smaller crowds, depending on where you're playing. Yeah, that's but, that's the uh, attitude, though, that allows that band to be what we know as the Doobie Brothers. And it, the, that level of professionalism, that level of gratitude for your audience, that level of wanting to deliver, creates that you know that fan base that will be loyal to you for a lifetime because you create I, memories that way. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. I was at a Prince show one time. Mm. And uh, he was playing a song, a ballad called The One. You know, it's a great song. Mm -hmm. But he was in the middle of the, like he had started the song off and was in the middle of the first verse of the song. And then when the first verse, you know, moved into that 
thing that it was going to do right before the chorus, he just cut. And the band picked up the hand signal and cut with him. And then he looked out in the audience and said, you guys aren't feeling that, huh? We're going to move <laughs> that. And then he moved on. And I remember, you know, that was a, it was a cool song. But at the time, it was an outdoor show. And it was at the Concord Pavilion, which is, you know, it's a, let's call it a knockoff Hollywood Bowl, right? It's mm-hmm. got feel, that amphitheater feel. It's outside. And it, it wasn't right at that moment. And it was right enough that if he had kept playing it, I would have kept loving it. But mm-hmm. for him to say, hey, you guys aren't feeling that, you know, we only have a certain amount of time here. Let's not waste your time. I got 4,000 hits. Let's, let's play some more. <laughs> you know, and I thought, yeah, yeah, yeah. that really is, he, he, he showed me the importance of, you know, exactly what you described, which is I'm vibing with this audience and I'm going to take them on this ride. And it's my responsibility to give them the best ride that I can. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, Man, I really appreciate that you're handing out these lessons to us and our audience and that you you are uh, so generous with all of your years of experience and encapsulating them this way. This is awesome for me. Thank you, John. It's, I hope you're having just a mildly okay time. <laughs> I'm enjoying myself a lot. I'm, I'm a teacher at heart. So oh, I, I, really, I really enjoy being able to share whatever experiences, you know, successes and mistakes with people and if you're watching there you go baby yeah (laughs) well let's say you're meeting with a young musician and he's got the good sense to know who you are and and your body of work and and a lot of things that came before his generation's body of work that's just developing Mm -hmm. and he meets you and he says hey you know what advice do you have for me as a young artist who is really just trying to be be good what do you tell that guy Oh, that's a loaded question. It's a loaded question because goals have changed in many respects. What mm. people see as being success isn't the same way my generation interpreted success. Obviously, success is you want to be able to make a living at what you're doing. And the more you make, the better, you know, as long as you're not ripping anybody off, it's a good thing. Mm. Um but how do you make money these days? I mean, for me, it's it's almost a no-brainer because I have a, a large library of work that I've accumulated over the years. I figured out that the streaming services ain't doing me no favors. Yeah. Hence, I ain't doing them no favors. Uh, my catalog, with the exception of one song, is not on any of the streaming services. Uh, one album, which I don't own, is not on any streaming service. I mean, it's, on, it's all over YouTube, but that's, you know... Be, uh, drive myself nuts trying to have stuff removed. So do I say don't do Spotify? You know, I mean, my my personal gut is I wouldn't do it. But you know what? If you're, le- if you're looking for a way to break through, consider it. But I always tell people that if they want to make it, aside from being serious about what they do and pursuing the art and crafts that they're working on to make them an artist. Uh, Obviously, you do that with all your heart and all your soul. If you want to be able to develop a fan base, i.e. people who will come to your shows, people who will hopefully buy your product, who will support you, um, what you need to do is to start at a grassroots level. Mm -hmm. Start playing in little neighborhood clubs. Develop an audience. Learn your craft better. And the better you become and the more of an audience you garner, the more clubs you can play, the, the, the further out of town you can go. And again, as the audience develops more, the larger the venues you can play. When it comes to getting a record deal, that's a tough one. You know, I, I don't even know what to say at this point, because yeah. at the end of the day, they're all 360 deals and the record company owns you lock, stock and barrel and your grandchildren all your too. Heart and all your, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, for me, but again, I have, however modest, I, I have somewhat of a name where I, I got enough fans who, you know, buy my product and see my, you know, expenditure go from the red into the black. Yeah. Um, but it's hard. You know, it's, 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 I mean, I've done it with not crowdfunding sites, but I've done it on my own, you know, website and social media where I say, you know, I'm working in the middle, I'm in the middle of an album. If you want to, 
donate to, you know, if the album's going to go for 20 bucks, I'll say, I'll give it to you for 17 and throw in the shipping as well. You know, if you don't mind waiting until the project is finished. Yeah. yeah. And so by doing that, you're able to pay the musicians, you're able to pay for the actual product to be really good. Well, yeah, to be really, but also, also to, you know, to come to life, to be a yeah. CD. Now, yeah. It, that becomes a little tricky in this day and age because how many people are buying CDs? Well, right. You know, yeah. I want, I want just as, as, as a, um, as an aside, I want to see, I have a really good osteopath, right? And I like to, when, when, when my bones are aching, you know, it's like a chiropractor, but more organic. I thought I'd like to share some music with him. And I just had a hunch given his age that I better ask him if he has a CD player first. <laughs> I asked him, and he said, "No, actually, I don't. Mm. Not on any of my computers." You know. Yeah. So I, I the next week I came in with a dongle, you know, a little USB <laughs> key, and said, that. "Here's here's the catalog for you." But the world's going in crazy places. It is going in crazy places. You know? I will say that there are still audio files out there, but uh, they're seeming to become few and far between, and and that path is narrowing which is terrible when you know a guy like Wes who can make things sound really really good and then everybody just wants it to be compressed onto an mp3 that they can stick on a thumb drive sure sure yeah but for, for that mp3 to work it has to sound good to begin with that's true that's, <laughs> yeah. True. Yeah. that's a great point hey we've had you for an hour and this has been a great hour for me I have been fortunate to meet a bunch of my musical heroes, but today has been a very special highlight, man. Thank you so much. Uh, bless you, John. Thank you very much. Well, let's do it again. There's a lot I'm more I can tell. I'm going to ask. That's terrific. I will take you up on it. We'll do it again. <laughs> Send you an email. We'll uh, we'll stay in touch, and we'll do it really soon. I want to really quickly shoot uh, sh- shoot a message out on this episode with Elliot Randall and uh, Wes Maybe to my uh, uncle Jesse Vitoris, who chimed in with a comment. Uh, because he's an amazing singer and has been a musical inspiration for me for all of my life. Just a cool set of pipes. So there you go, Uncle Jesse. And uh, also want to just say, hey, if you guys want to know more about Elliot Randall and follow him and, and uh, figure out a little more of that wisdom that exists in his body of work, you can go to Elliot-Randall.com. Uh, that's Elliot, two L's and two T's, dash Randall with two L's. Why, thank you. Um, check out the website. Stay in touch. And uh, this has been a wonderful hour for me. Thank you, guys. Pleasure. Thank you. A real time. pleasure. Elliot, thank you so much. Great, John. A real pleasure. I'll see you soon. Everybody, this is Elliot Randall. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>